Hi, and welcome to Art Laughs with me, Verity Babs. Today, I spoke to Harriet Brain, and we spoke about a painting by Asker Yorn. We also spoke about Harriet's career combining comedy, art history, and music. And I hope you enjoyed the episode. I'm here today with Harriet Brain. Harriet, please introduce yourself. Hello, um, I'm Harriet Brain, as, as you just said. And um, I work at a museum and I also do comedy, but have done neither for the past few months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm catching all these comedians at a very odd time to be like, introduce yeah. your work. And they're like, well, I haven't for quite a long time. What's that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember that? Harriet, you also are an art historian. Your comedy focuses a lot around artists and art history. And you've got these amazing songs. So really thrilled to talk to you today about some art. And you've picked such a cool painting. Why don't you introduce it for us? <laughs> um, so it's called The Disquieting Duckling or The Disturbing Duckling. It's kind of like up to you how you translate it from the Danish um, by uh, Esger Jorn and yeah he's a Danish artist that I got really into when I was doing my art history thesis um, at university. I think this painting and also other work by Esger Jorn has also kind of inspired um, my comedy in a quite a big way as well in a very sort of obvious and heavy-handed way like his idea is which is basically to to take uh, a piece of sort of well-known or not well-known but like take a piece of uh, uh, you know uh, recognizable and uh, pleasant uh, art so he took he took like a landscape for this with a little cottage in it very sort of Nordic and then he like paints this huge rainbow duckling on it and in a similar way I hope I take sort of like familiar songs and then um yeah put make uh make them about new things like yeah artists or paintings or um scientists sometimes that was my latest show but would you mind oh, yeah. reeling, reeling reeling off for us some some of the combinations of artists and songs that you've done well, I must say that they are all on my SoundCloud. Love it. So, uh, yeah, they can be found there. All of the all of my art history songs are on my SoundCloud, which is, you know, Harriet Bra- uh, SoundCloud slash Harriet Brain, I think. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. So I've got like Giacometti, Black Betty. Uh, I've got like Picasso to the tune of Abracadabra by the Steve Miller Band. I've got, oh yeah, Suzanne, Roxanne by The Police. That's a That's, classic. I remember that one. That is so yeah. good. <laughs> oh yeah, and I do, I do one about Diego Rivera to, to, to Whenever, Wherever by uh, Shakira. <laughs> Although I feel really weird about doing that because I do that one in like a sort of Spanish accent and I feel really like dodgy about doing that now. I used <laughs> to do a lot of accents and I don't know how, I, I thought it's nothing, nothing's really like, changed like people still do accents and they're still funny and I still find them funny but I kind of cringe when I do them now I was doing an an improv show up in Edinburgh we do a game Uh where to sort of challenge the improvisers we ask for uh, an accent for them to do this next round of this little game in and we normally ask for an accent uh, of um you know I think it was an English-speaking nation so that we don't get anything that's you know going to be yeah <laughs> and then um someone you know, shouted shouted somewhere like um you know kenyan or something we said it's not not um you know we're not going to take it because obviously like racist implications <laughs> and then the guy at the back was heckled and was like accents aren't racist we're like oh or are they <laughs> so it's an interesting it's a really interesting question because you can't really properly argue either way mm. um yeah, yeah, it's really, but like I do definitely feel a bit weird about doing them now. But I do, I like doing, um, like I do, I do a French one. Oh my god, who's that? But let's just say I don't do a Chinese accent when I sing my song about Ai Weiwei. Uh, so that you know that kind of says it all, doesn't it? Really, that was that. I think I feel like that's the right artistic choice. <laughs> <laughs> when you sent this to me my first instinct was to be like oh amazing I wonder 
where this guy is showing because it looks so modern. And then you're like, oh, no, he's dead. 1959, I think, this painting. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, you know, the the original, original, yeah, I don't even know what the original painting is, like, of the little cottage. I don't know how old that is. I don't know if he's, like, defaced a priceless antique. Probably not. Um, (laughs) He was trying to be sort of provocative, and he was in a a group of artists um, who were doing that kind of thing at the time. I mean, he was sort of a little bit on his you know out on a, out on his own a bit as well but like he was kind of involved with this group called cobra um who were kind of involved with the situationists as well um which is something i tried to unpick in my uh dissertation and failed <laughs> <laughs> i didn't fail my dissertation but like it was quite clear that i didn't really know what i was talking about i was kind of all right when i got to the end because i'd i'd started back then in the 60s and didn't really understand it but by the time the end of the thesis, I'd moved on to like much more contemporary stuff, which mm. turns out I'm better at writing about. <laughs> I had the thing with my thesis of I feel like if you're going to pick an artist or an artwork that people have already written about, you have to have a really hot take. Whereas, exactly. Yeah. Whereas I found some some pretty niche bits of sort of ephemera invitations to Victorian art galleries and stuff, and because no one had written about it before, I was able to just go. In conclusion, ta-da, <laughs> I found them. <laughs> Aren't they interesting? And that was it. So, <laughs> But this is really interesting, I think, in how old this piece is, because I think there's an assumption that it's only contemporary art that has ever tried to be edgy in any way or has ever tried oh. to... Exactly. You know, we now look at things like what Picasso was doing and, you know, what the Cubists were doing and, and the Futurists and all these kind of groups. And we think of that as traditional art now because it's a hundred years old and it's in museums and it becomes quite staid and traditional by being a gallery well, work. Like modernism is canon now. So it's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, it's exactly. mad, isn't it? Cause I really like how sort of how unsubtle it is as a, as a, as a piece of work. Like it's, it's very clear what he's doing. He's not trying to be subtle. He's not trying to say something really complicated. It doesn't need explaining. Um, although some people might disagree with that. Um, but it's it's like it's clearly yeah like two fingers up to the mm. to um, the prevailing uh, popular uh, friendly form of art that was popular at the time. I think that a lot <laughs> of people who like, if they looked at this, it's interesting that you brought up the idea of whether it needs explaining because I think this is one of those pieces where you know if someone was unsure about art or felt a bit nervous in the gallery space, they might go, oh, I don't get it because there's this idea that art has to have this really complicated meaning behind it. But actually all there is to get is this guy's been like, I'm going to paint a massive duck on this. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's so clear. And like, it was really nice because at the time uh, when I was looking at these, at this sort of art and that kind of artist, like at the, I was at the, in the final year of my degree, obviously. And um, I was doing a degree that was also half, studio practice and half oh, art cool. history which was great um but we all went slightly mad um by the end because it was like just so much, it was just a lot of work yeah. um it was a bit like doing two degrees and <laughs> like we ended up having like making really like party like art party kind of work like a lot of parody like there was loads of parodies going on and that's when I first started like I seen parodies of other works of art Mm. in a physical form and that is exactly when I wrote my first art history songs like my first parody songs about art history was was at the same time as me discovering this painting for the first time and and um and yeah like it was a sort of it captured the mood which is I think why like my first couple of gigs just in front of like my art friends like was encouraging enough to carry on doing it later it was a few years later that I like started doing again in London but I remember hearing your songs and seeing you perform when I was still in university and I was doing stand-up and stuff then as well and this idea of you know these things can go hand in hand and hearing your songs is really interesting because they weren't necessarily at that point always artists that I knew a lot about or artworks I knew a lot about and yet they still are relatable and funny and you don't really need to know everything about Vincent van Gogh to get why it's funny because I was really under the impression that like if people didn't know a the song b the artist that it wouldn't work at all but yeah like it's surprising how many people 
have said like oh what was that what was that song like was that did you write that song yourself and I'm like no I don't I don't really do that <laughs> like but I've started doing more of that because I've realized that like that ha- it having to be a, it doesn't have to be a song that people recognize for it for it to be funny although it does really help um mm. especially when you've got audiences that are sort of more bemused by the art stuff but then like what I what I have learned doing these songs is that like even if you're doing them in a you know in front of like a a room full of truckers so like enough of them have a connection to it for it to for it to work and I've learned to like you know don't don't do material you assume your audience will like I mean I've never had the option because I don't I don't have any like normal like jokes <laughs> or, like, like normal stuff it's worked I mean thus far live very well mm. in front of like most audiences which has really surprised me I didn't think it would work at all mm. in terms of these songs and your and your show sort of being a vehicle for this do you think that it has a sort of almost accessibility drive behind it in terms of introducing new people to art or or was that not something that was necessarily like a goal it wasn't to be honest mm. it wasn't a goal but it it was really nice that it because, yeah, my first show, uh, my debut, as they say, when you take a show to Edinburgh for the first time, um, was entirely a, a parody songs about artists. Um, and people were so happy to learn about, yeah, about artists they, that they'd never heard of before. Like, especially, um, I think I did, like, my Jack and Nettie song in that show. And so many people had never heard of him before and they like <laughs> were like they were sort of googling because I don't really mind if people are on their phones in my gigs because they're usually googling what I'm saying <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I remember like doing the Giacometti song and this woman like was sort of not really get like laughing and then I saw her like looking up Giacometti sculptures on her phone and then she started laughing <laughs> so, so like some some knowledge or like visual memory of of it obviously does help mm. but yeah i have i have been i have been surprised about how um it's not necessarily um too opaque you know as a as a subject yeah, cuz i guess in edinburgh as well there's this idea that you either go and see comedy or you go and see you know a proper talk or you go you know there's feel that very separate <laughs> yeah. categories so when you're actually doing something vaguely let's say educational but vaguely with mm. a sort of academic standpoint it's potentially hard to get the audiences that you know just being like I tell jokes might get or or just an, mm. like a straight academic talk might get yeah I got a really interesting audience actually because I, d- I did get quite a lot of people who were not comedy people like they, they weren't they said things like oh I, w- I wouldn't usually c- see comedy you know they're kind of sort of BBC tent type people who yeah would go to see a lot more serious stuff um and uh that was yeah it was really nice and i also got like lots of art students as well which was i guess kind of expected but also like i didn't i wasn't that interested in the edinburgh festival when i was at uni ed- in edinburgh which i you know should probably have said at the beginning um <laughs> that's, that's where i studied art and like when i was a student there the festival was like an absolute nightmare and i hated it and I was like, Ugh. and then it was only after I left and started dabbling in comedy that I realized like, oh my gosh, I should go back. But it makes so much sense. <laughs> I was there the whole time. Why, and you were there, why, why and you wasn't I taking there. advantage of this thing and like going to see hundreds of shows? <laughs> well, Harriet, thank you so much for talking to me today. Could you let us know, you mentioned your SoundCloud at the beginning, mm-hmm. but could you let us know where else we can follow you and hear from you to keep updated? Um, updated? Not that I am making anything at the moment. Um, Twitter, Instagram, at Harriet Brain on everything really. Um, it's luckily quite an unusual name, so I haven't had to make up more interesting ones. Yeah, SoundCloud, I've, I, that one thing I have managed to do during lockdown is to finally put my completed oeuvre of mm. art history songs on there. And I'm not going to be adding any more, I don't think, ever. Um, other stuff I'm doing, I haven't managed to record one of my shows because mm. things have managed to sort of fuck up every time. 
so you can't see you can't see any of my holders but i've got a couple of things on youtube but yeah again harriet brain on youtube thanks for watching you can follow harriet in the ways written below and as per usual you can follow me at severity babs art on instagram please do subscribe and share and give us a like and i will see you next time